Heard AM, you've heard FM. Now, tune into DM Radio, the world's longest running show about data. Each week, host Eric Cavanaugh interviews the brightest minds in the world of information management. Want to be on the show? Send an email to info at dmradio.biz. Now, here's your host, Eric Cavanaugh. All right, ladies and gentlemen, hello and welcome back once again to the longest running show in the world about data. It's called DM Radio. Yours truly, Eric Cavanaugh here with a couple experts on the topic of data fabric and data mesh. We'll be talking to Doug Kimball of Onto Text, a longtime friend of mine, and Rex Allstrom from a company called Synity. Used to be called Back Office Associates. They've rebranded with a cooler name, I have to say. I think Synity sounds cooler. It's like Synergy and Infinity all together. It's Pretty good, uh, pretty good concept they've woven together there. And we're talking about this very hot topic of data mesh. What is a data mesh? How can you build a data mesh? Well, you start with the data fabric. So just very quickly for the benefit of our listening audience out there, we've gone from data persisted in single databases to data in data warehouses pulled from all sorts of operational systems. This concept of a data lake came along and then the lake house. So the lake house architecture is the new hot thing to talk about, which really tries to combine the best of both worlds, the best of data warehousing and the best of data lakes. So data warehouses are fast. You can have a lot of concurrent users. It's for your certified, trusted data. A data lake is really for all kinds of different data at scale, lots and lots of data. And you had this whole concept of a schema on read, meaning you didn't have to force data into a particular schema to load the data to get it up uh, in a warehouse somewhere. You just put it in your data lake. Well, we've learned all kinds of lessons throughout that time period. And then a lady named Jamak Degani, uh, who is now with her own company, Next Data, she was with ThoughtWorks before, came out with this concept of data mesh. And the idea basically is to compartmentalize the management of data. So you have people in research and development or pe people in marketing or people in accounting responsible for their own data, responsible for their own information resources. And then they share that via some controlled APIs, application program interfaces. So it's a, it's a big vision. It's in the process of now being realized by any number of vendors. Lots of companies are talking about this. If you just do a search for data mesh, you'll see like 15 companies advertising on top of data mesh. And that's because there is a recognition that this is a real practical approach to move forward to kind of solve some of these problems. Because when you try to centralize everything, when you centralize management, when you centralize the data in a single repository, you get all kinds of issues. One, you're trying to force everything into a particular schema. That can be a problem. But two, there's just a lot of sort of lag time. There become some political issues. There's all sorts of stuff that happens. And then, of course, we have all this AI that people are talking about now, ChatGPT, for example, having some really interesting capabilities to supercharge content creation, but uh, not just for marketing purposes. It's actually good for business plans. It's actually good for all kinds of things. We'll find out about that today. So with that, I'll bring in Doug Kimball from Ontotext. First, so Doug, uh, Ontotext has a knowledge graph, yes. which could play very well into a data mesh or a data fabric, I, I should probably say. But tell us a bit about Ontotext and what you folks are working on. Sure. Yeah, Ontotext, we've been around <clears throat> about 20 years. If you've heard of GraphDB, uh, that is our baby. Uh, sometimes we're more well known for GraphDB than we are for our actual name. So something that I'm working on changing. But yeah, we are a knowledge graph company. We've been doing knowledge graph, semantic knowledge graph technology for close to 20 years. Uh, we've got you know clients across the world doing different things with that, everything from financial services to life sciences. Um, what I think is really just neat about what it is that we do is this sheer applicability of knowledge graphs to pretty much any business or technical use case out there. Uh, one of the most challenging things I've found is that it is so universal, which makes sometimes explaining, <clears throat> I think, what a knowledge graph is and where it could play whether it's text analytics or semantic understanding or inferences or reasoning, there's a lot of power behind that. Um, so yeah, it's it's an interesting interesting technology for sure. And I love how you queued that up with, you know, looking at data fabric and decentralized data sources. If if I haven't met a company that has those problems, I'll be surprised. So yeah, that's, right. That's that's it. That's it in a nutshell. Obviously, we'll we'll get into more detail, but um, you know, I think it fits very well into your topics of data fabric support into data mesh. 
Yeah, and to kind of explain to our audience, uh, this concept of a graph database or graph technology is very different from a relational database, for example, or a traditional rows and columns type database. If mo almost everyone in the business world knows Microsoft Excel, you've got rows and columns, you can have multiple tabs in a particular worksheet, for example, and you can have relationships between them, but it's a very specific view of the world. It's a tabular view of the world, as you say, Whereas with the graph database, you have typically nodes and edges, and the nodes tend to be entities. The edges tend to be characteristics of those entities. And so any node can have as many edges as there are characteristics to plot. And the reason why this matters, uh, if you think about search and what search did and what companies like Elasticsearch have done to be able to enable people in large organizations to get to a particular piece of data that they want, well, everyone knows how to use Google, and now people are using ChatGPT in, in similar, but I think expanded and more enriched ways. But the point is, with a knowledge graph, you can really expedite the path to insight for your mm -hmm. business users. Isn't that the main goal, Doug? That's one of the main goals. And I think that the, the, the other thing I would add in there is the ability to reuse data. That's one of the things we talk a lot about when you look at putting a, a knowledge graph into action, so creating a practice or solving problems with a knowledge graph, uh, the benefit of having the, the semantic technology behind this is that you can draw inferences across your data and use it in other places. So it's not just a one and done kind of a database and you only use it for one particular purpose. Uh, the value of building out your knowledge graph right from the beginning is that you have that scalability. You know, you have that persistence. You're not locked into a certain way of how you have to do business with your data sources. Now you have much more power. So I think that's one of the things, but the other way to look at it is just now you can look at data in a real world connection perspective. So you're connecting entities and concepts and ideas and thoughts and text, you know, all that structured and unstructured data. To me, that's where I even, a broader perspective of knowledge graph is that more complete picture of your data. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it, it helps, again, it helps the business understand complex terms. Uh, it's, it's very useful in yep. issues like pharmaceutical research, for example, because you can have all these different entities and you can kind of relate them. But the point is it's a foundation to knowledge sharing and knowledge uh, accrual, I guess. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I, I probably overuse the term foundation, I guess, coming from the MDM world. That's sort of my, my brain set. But I, I truly believe that is it. Because if you have that knowledge graph as that, that core of everything that you build from there, in some ways, the knowledge graph should almost end up being invisible, for lack of a better term, because the systems and processes that are built on top of it use that in order to make all you know better decisions, better insights, have better analytics, you know, volume, profit, and share decisions. If it's working right, you don't really know that you've got a knowledge graph. You're just utilizing that in order to well, let's deploy things faster, lower your risks, bring you know, bring products to market faster. You talked about you know target drug, you know, target and drug discovery with life science as an example. That all happens because you can search and connect these different entities, whether it's free text or structured data, et cetera. You can pull all that together without having to worry about. Where is the data located, and do I have those connections made? The knowledge graph with that the ontology, so you have you have knowledge on top of that, connects all that and provides additional information and insights to make better decisions. Because now you're you're connecting more things as opposed to to your point relationally go down. It, knowledge graphs go where the data is. Hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, I'll bring in uh, Rex Alstrom from Sanity to comment on this. Rex, tell us a bit about yourself. And of course, you folks use a knowledge graph as well, at least in terms of your ERP implementations, helping companies go from uh, an older version of SAP ERP to HANA, for example. Tell us a bit about Synity and how knowledge graphs work in and data fabric. Yeah, uh, thanks very much, Eric. And uh, that's a perfect intro, Doug, uh, to a discussion of a company that uh, likes to frame ourselves as a business that really helps large enterprise tackle their largest data problems, right? We, we deal with the largest data problems mm -hmm. in the world. Um, Synity works a lot with uh, Fortune 500 companies that may have literally hundreds of ERP applications and not just ERP, but CRM applications, uh, supply chain management, PLM, you name it, right? 
And um, we chose when we built our cloud platform to be able to enable some of this more advanced capability to have a knowledge graph embedded within inside of our solution. And the concept is that uh, if we go into a company and they've got this big mess, right, of legacy that may have grown through acquisition or divestitures and other things over the last you know, 25 years, how do you make sense of all of that? Mm -hmm. So uh, we take a very pragmatic approach of being able to do the metadata scanning of the applications that they're out there, put them in context, start getting an idea of, of what the key critical business terms, policies, rules, systems, data sets are that make up that customer landscape. And the reason we do that is that when we do a consolidation as part of a digital transformation or move to cloud or whatever the project driver is, we don't want to just lift and shift that data, right? Mm -hmm. That's like putting gas from your lawnmower into your, you know, brand new Porsche. Uh, it, it's not a good idea, right? You want to right size that data. You want high quality cleanse data. You want data that will support proper execution of the business processes and probably the reason why you were able to get the funding to go and begin this digital transformation to begin with, right? Hmm. So um, uh, Knowledge Graph is really central then to how we operate because we can not only store the business and technical metadata associated with the applications we deal with, but we're starting to be able to create associations between that. And it allows us to go and look at things like order to cash processes or procure to pay processes and how data and the interrelated nature of data supports those business processes. Because ultimately, that's what they're trying to optimize. So they're not just trying to buy a new application. They want to run their business better. Mm -hmm. And uh, the beauty of a knowledge graph is that it's not the individual siloed assets that are important, right? It's the connectivity, or as you said, the edges between all of those assets. So we use the knowledge graph as a way to store the assets that we're collecting across the business of, of all the different types of assets that I discussed, but then start doing proactive analysis on where there are high rates of connectivity, where there are associations, what can we infer um, using AI, ML models and other techniques to find areas of opportunity? And how can we definitively show then that, for example, improvements in data quality in certain master data objects within the business can actually create a monetary or definitive outcome uh, that the business can realize. And you know, look, in today's economy, when, when uh, CFOs are demanding that, that you demonstrate clear business outcome in order to make large investments in, in IT and infrastructure and applications, if you can't come through that door and show them very quickly in the early phases what that business outcome will be and how it could be monetized, it's going to be very hard to implement yet another solution, right? Mm. So it's all about leveraging the power of uh, of what we store and how we leverage that graph technology in the context of how we go to market that I think makes us very unique and differentiated among our competitors. Yeah, no, this is interesting stuff. And you know, the, when you think about the business value of a data fabric, let's say, what you're really trying to do is optimize the access, use, and persistence of data for business purposes. And you know, historically, again, you you have applications running off databases. You have an application that connects to a customer database, or some sort of uh, product database, or whatever the case may be, and does its job. Well, with a data fabric, you're trying to expand that out to where the fabric can work for all sorts of different applications in all sorts of different ways. And so you're sharing that data instead of, for example, creating copies of the data, sharding the data, et cetera, doing all these little tricks that we've come up with over the years to be able to facilitate performance. The idea is with the right architectural approach, you solve a lot of those performance problems out of the box theoretically. Is that about right? Yeah, I think a lot of them can be solved with the data fabric. Um, uh, I know that there are a lot of vendors, a lot of technologies out there to go and implement this uh, technique or really this design pattern. I would refer to it more that way. Um, I think that the idea here is that 
the yeah, overused phrase, but the democratization of data, right? The ability to get to a semantic model versus a physical storage model, to be able to get out of the siloed, isolated thinking of this department, this system, this master data object, and the tools that surround those silos to a level where the systems don't matter as much below. Uh, what matters is that you have a consolidated view of information mm. and fuel and accelerate, whether it's an analytics program, uh, whether you're trying to get the right data to feed your AI ML model to make critical decision, uh, business decision uh, making, or even in the use of, uh, again, a, a very uh, popular phrase these days, generative AI. Mm -hmm. And um, it, 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 we did this uh, at, the, at a recent show where we actually went to chat GPT and we said, what is the best way to train a generative AI model? And it came back and said, graph technologies are ideal for being able to train generative AI because it has all of the associative information, not just the individual piece parts, right? So, um, you know, there are some interesting things that can be done once you adopt not only a graph uh, database, but are trying to implement uh, data fabrics where the generative AI or the automated components of a data fabric really come into play. Hmm. This is fascinating stuff. I mean, we are at this inflection point. And if you read Jamak Degani's paper about data mesh, that's what she talks about, right? Is that this is an inflection point and how she's trying to learn some lessons from the operational world and apply them to the analytical world such that these teams can get the best value from their data while also sharing with other people, right? I mean, silos, that's one of the huge issues that we run into. A lot of problems are caused because we have data silos. And then you're either copying data or, or copying little bits and pieces of data to move over here. And the second you've done that, you've opened a can of worms, right? I mean, you're, you're now going to have to be able to track that stuff down. You know, we want governance, we want audit trails, all these things become extremely difficult, if not impossible, when you just start running copies of data everywhere that different people are using at different times, right? So it's it's important, I think, and this is, it's just wild how this is all coming together right now with these chat GPT style large language models, which are amazing, which can do absolutely amazing things. We're just now beginning to understand what they can do, quite frankly. And, you know, some of the bad press around it has been, I think, misleading or at least misguided, talking about, oh, is it sentient? Is it going to take over the world? No, it's just trying to predict what it thinks you want based upon the text prompt that you give it. But folks, don't touch that. I'll be right back. You are listening to DM Radio. Welcome back to DM Radio. Here's your host, Eric Cavanaugh. All right, folks, back here on DM Radio talking how to enable a data mesh. You build a data fabric. We're talking to Doug Kimball of Onto Text and Rex Alstrom from Synity. That's S Y N I T I, if you want to look it up, Onto Text, just like it sounds. And, you know, I'm trying to wrap my head around again data mesh versus data fabric. One of the arguments is that you, in order to really do data mesh, you have to have a data fabric. That's the concept here. Um, but these are layers of abstraction, essentially. And maybe I'll throw it over to, to Rex to kind of clarify. If you're building out your data fabric, what you're really trying to understand is where is data coming from? Where is it going? How can we facilitate that in a governed way that is intuitive, that business users can understand, and thus retain governance or even improve governance capabilities and ideally improve performance. Is that about right? Uh, yeah. Ultimately, customers want access to information that isn't limited by the applications it comes from. And that can't all be achieved just through integration or data warehousing or other techniques, right? We've done that for a long time. Uh, but we know the pace of change that occurs with inside of businesses um, and that alone drives the need to have something that's more real time, more predictive and deliver higher order value faster right, to those end data consumers. Um, when talking about the topic specifically a mesh versus fabric, it depends on where the customer is in their journey as well. 
if you're going to implement a data mesh, it, it tends to, there are a lot of design patterns, but it tends to be a little bit more decentralized, um, but still collecting the same types of assets. What's the information we have? What are our data sets? What are our terms? What are all the key aspects of data that I care about? And then be able to curate that up for consumption by those data consumers. Uh, data Fabric goes one level higher to say, well, if we were to centralize that information, if we were to come up with a semantic layer, if you will, of how I interpret and access information, and then you add in a lot of the automated capabilities of being able to have predictive models in place that are looking at the information within that semantic model, so that, for example, a user logs in, they're used to running certain data sets or looking at, at certain queries or other information, it can create inferences of other things that they may want to consider uh, that may have been produced by other areas of the team. So, you know, Data Fabric is, is very much combining that information, adding another degree of automation to it, and then uh, self-discovering and self-suggesting new ways that those business consumers can take advantage of that information. Mm -hmm. And Doug, maybe I'll bring you back in on this. The whole concept of collaboration, Rex just meant, mentioned the data consumers being able to facilitate in tagging data, for example, and explaining data and offering some context around definitions of different things. That collaboration is really key. And, and once again, uh, we want to be able to enable people across the organization to get into the weeds that matter to them and right. not get sort of bewildered by the weeds that don't matter to them. Is that about right? Well, you know, that, that's something that's well said. I mean, we've been talking about collaboration as both the business and IT industry for, for decades. And we've tried it in different fashions with different technologies and tools. You know, I, I think the concept of data fabric with data mesh supported by knowledge graph gets us significantly closer than we've ever been. I mean, if you look at the ability and Rex talked about, you know, applying that semantic layer. So now your data producers and your data consumers don't have to know the same things, but we apply that semantic layer on top. So we have a, a shared or collaborative understanding of the definitions of the data, the definitions of the, the business things pieces. Now you're collaborating. So now we're actually getting value from all that data. Um, but I think if you, if you extend that even further, when you first think about collaboration, you may not realize all the assets that are available to you in an organization. You know, we get so used to using the typical structured data, it goes in a certain fashion. But, you know, I was reading an article someplace about the amount of unstructured data is almost 80% in an average organization. I maybe miss off and off the number, the closer in there. And, you know, all those PDFs that are out there, all those handwritten notes, all those things that's video or audio, unstructured data that's extremely powerful. And if you and I can collaborate on that information by having that fed to me through a data fabric model, I, you know, that's where I think this, this collaboration you know, business outcomes, and again, I really appreciate that Rex keeps going the same mindset I have is the reason behind this, that's where the value continues to be, I think, just outstanding. Hmm. Yeah, this is interesting. And maybe Rex, I'll bring you back in to, to comment on this. You mentioned uh, automation being woven into the data fabric. So that's kind of interesting. I, I guess what you're referring to is when a particular user wants to access this particular data or run this report or something, you can you can identify patterns where that's going to happen and then automate some data collection or aggregation or calculations or whatever to facilitate that. Is that right? Yeah, it's really multiple levels of automation. So there's the you know, data caching and and making sure that that the responsiveness of the data fabric is is very high uh, based on because a lot of times we're dealing with large global enterprises right where are they in the world where does that data live what what is the surface that they're uh you know accessing the information or trying to access the information um but it goes beyond uh speed to also start really predicting usage patterns hmm. So um, if you think about how things have been done in the past, and Doug, in the first segment, you mentioned MDM, right? I've been around MDM for a very long time too, right? What did we try to do? We said, okay, here's the golden record. Here's, here are the key data elements. Here are the mission critical, not as mission critical. You know, we're going to kind of curate all this and we're going to pass the golden record around. And, you know, this is how we're going to run the operation. 
Um, but the problem is that the data that feeds many of the systems, especially in our composable ERP world today, uh, change frequently. Business processes change. Businesses are much more nimble. And so if you have to have an army of people that are updating your knowledge graph or updating all of the key assets and uh, doing the metadata updates and everything else, it's it's going to break down. And that's been the problem in the past, right? But newer types of technologies can be used to automate a lot of those processes from the metadata level to the integration level, and now at that semantic level, so that the system, based on how people are using it, can actually proactively update, can predict new metadata that may have become available. And if hmm. the machine can't determine its definition or viability, it can surface it through workflows to knowledge workers that can validate or enhance that information. So, wow. you know, data fabric becomes a much more of a proactive engine um, and requiring less human intervention uh, to keep it delivering that business value. And, and as Doug, you said, collaboration among business stakeholders. And you hate yeah. to use the term future proof because it always never works out exactly the way you want. But I think that's yeah. one of the things I like what you're saying there, Rex, is that like again, building this right, it allows as you bring in new technology, new systems, new processes to plug and plug and play. Pardon, I'm not a techie person anymore, but drop it into that. So you don't have to completely redo your technical architecture. You're leveraging the structure that already exists that is more flexible and scalable. So yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah exactly. Yeah, that that's fascinating. So uh, what I'm kind of hearing here, and maybe Rex will throw it over to you first, and then over to Doug. You, know, you look at the explosion of observability vendors and observability all of a sudden is everywhere, right? Well, why is that? I think one reason is because of Kubernetes being a new de facto standard as the foundation, right? As the technical infrastructure on which these new apps are running, basically. So all these companies are refactoring to run on Kubernetes, at least to some extent. And observability is, is watching all these different sources and looking for anomalies and looking for uh, outages and dark data and all these other kinds of things, which gets very interesting when you come when you combine all of that with machine learning and AI, which is very good at pattern recognition. And so to your point a minute ago, Rex, you know, being able to predict when you'll need to run some calculations to feed a particular <clears throat> report or a service, that's a very big deal. So you think about like predictive maintenance in the world of IoT, right? Mm -hmm. Where you can look at all this data, all this raw data of wheels spinning and the sounds that they make and all these things. What they're doing is they're identifying leading indicators of problems. And that's what you're talking about here. A leading indicator via some observability tool can tell you, aha, this data pipeline is going to break because of X, Y, Z. That completely changes the game of troubleshooting, right? I talk about this a lot in, in the IoT space. I'll just make this metaphor and I'll throw it over to, to Rex. Think about the job of the maintenance engineer was just revolutionized because beforehand, he or she would just go through this rope process, check wheel one, check wheel two, check the door, check the this, check that. Who cares? You just get bored and you're like, oh, you fall asleep at the wheel, basically, pun intended, I guess. Mm -hmm. But with, with this predictive maintenance, now you know that what you're working on matters because you have a signal that's telling you, hey, this wheel is going to break. And I'm 30, 40 miles from East Palestine here in Pittsburgh. So we know what happens when wheels break on big trains and have vinyl chloride on them. Bad things happen. But what do you think about that metaphor and, and how it relates to a data fabric, Rex? Um, yeah, so it's a it's a great example. Um, and you mentioned observability. I would throw another word in there, which is augmented. Mm -hmm. um, you, yeah. Pick your favorite analyst firm. It's hard to say the words that we used to know, data quality, master <laughs> data management, integration, without now changing that say augmented data quality, augmented master data management, augmented integration. Everything is augmented. And, and it's that concept, just like in predictive maintenance, that we're able to use the data artifacts that we can gather through many different types, streaming, right. static, you name it. Uh, to be able to feed into models and to be able to provide predictive results. Um, I would take your example one step further, right? Predictive maintenance is awesome and it's made huge strides over the years. Uh, but think about the supply chain problem 
that also is sitting right next to it. So we've got predictive maintenance. Uh, we're a large enterprise. Um, some of these places, depending on the industry, could carry parts worth millions of dollars per part, right? So they're trying to optimize their maintenance and repair operation while also optimizing vendor spend, as well as um, uh, warehousing, storage, location, and availability, right? So what we're talking about now is going beyond even just predictive maintenance to say, no, I'm going to optimize my entire supply chain. I'm going to make sure that I'm not paying for workers to show up and then find out they don't have a part, even though it's been predicted. And I'm going to um, reduce my cash spend and my inventory carry because I can optimize how that is uh, augmented by, there's that word, uh, by what we're predicting that we need from a maintenance perspective. So right. yeah, this is where you really get the attention of the CFOs and others inside of these organizations, because now we're no longer just talking about the particular business process we're optimizing. We're talking about real money real cost of the business and real optimization that ultimately impacts their competitive position and other things in the marketplace. Yeah. Not to mention well, you things can... fail and what that means from a press perspective, it's if it's catastrophic enough. Well, sure. And you're, you're getting out from behind the eight ball. I mean, I'll throw that one over to you, Doug. I think a lot of organizations from a data perspective and analytics perspective, in many cases, they're behind the eight ball. Think about the uh, ETL developers hitting batch windows, right? I mean, I think the 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 end of the batch window came about ten years ago, and we've been trying to find ways to solve that ever since. And I think data fabric is coming along as a sort of strategic solvent for that conundrum. But what do you think, Doug? I think so, and it, it's <laughs> you, you look you know, the term data data observability. I, I still struggle with that one, just to be completely frank. I met with a former colleague of mine at the Gartner conference. We were talking about it, and he goes, "Oh, look, there's some data. Am I being a data observer?" <laughs> um, you know, so I it, I chuckle, but it, it, you know, words do mean things. That's why we talk about semantics. But I, I agree with with Rex. You know, augmented data still kind of pops in my mind. Uh, when you look at, and I'm glad you brought up IoT and supply chains. That's another area I've got some experience and I'm passionate about. I think that's where what we're talking about those to so the whole connections and you know any data any data in regardless of your format being able to be brought together IoT and those sensors you put on production lines just as an example from the supply chain side you know to really start to pull all that together regardless of what type of sensor it is what type of format it is pull it all together so I can do predictive maintenance prescriptive maintenance all those things and now take that you know to Rex's point augment that data so it becomes more valuable because now it's being shared and I'm not that guy walking around every 30 minutes checking a box. I'm getting information sent to me regardless of where I am and it's all automated. That again, I think if you look at data observability is we're using that kind of a data being connected with, and you, you basically talk about predictions and inferences with additional information on top of it. Hey, we, may, we recommend you go do X and Y and Z because it's powered by all that information within the knowledge graph and shared across the data fabric. So hmm. that's, again, the supply chain IoT piece, we could go another hour in that particular direction. I think it's fascinating. But I see this whole concept of interconnected information by data fabric applying so well to the supply chain, control towers looked on and everything that provide the direction and the, you know, the consistency and guidance. But having that, going back to the earlier conversation, that foundation of good data being shared, that's the right. start. Yeah, no, that's right. Well, folks, we'll get into the weeds a bit more in our next segment. We're talking to Doug Kimball of Onto Text and Rex Alstrom from Synity on DM Radio. We'll be right back. Don't touch that down. Welcome back to DM Radio. Here's your host, Eric Kavanaugh. Here on DM Radio, talking all things data fabric and data mesh with Doug Kimball of Onto Text and Rex Alstrom from Synity. And uh, maybe Rex, I'll throw this first question over to you. It seems to me the the days of the big box deployments of huge enterprise systems with five, ten million dollar budgets they are going to take six months to eighteen months. Those days are are kind of over. I mean, there are still some things that are going to require capital investment. But if you think about the economy and where things are headed. And uh, even 
just orchestration of containers, for example, how that changes the nature of what we're doing. I think the key is that you have to find ways to incrementally build out whatever it is that you want these days. You cannot shut down operations for six months and redeploy a data fabric, for example, to replace your database. It's just not going to happen. So my question is, what is a reasonable, practical way for organizations to start incrementally moving toward a data fabric? Is it you focus on one silo first, a domain? What are your thoughts on how to get it done in pieces and parts over time? So my recommendation would be that you kind of start a bit top down. You know, what is it that you're trying to get out of a data fabric implementation? Uh, too often, you know, companies get the latest buzz thing and and then they say well we have to be doing something with that we have to be doing something with chat gpt or generative ai we have to be doing something with go back over history right uh there are a lot of different hot topics that reach the top of the hype cycle um but with no real focus in terms of what that was going to develop for them in terms of business outcome uh as you said throwing large amounts of money and just buying things uh, to implement is is really not the strategy of any uh, successful business that I've seen out there of recent. So when starting on a, a journey on a data fabric, I would say first, what is it that you're trying to empower? Is there a particular area of the business where you think it will deliver the highest value? You don't have to implement a corporate-wide data fabric in order to right. get value. You can target specific areas of the business. Maybe it's an area where KPIs are suffering, where you can demonstrably say that better access to information in this area will, will improve that business outcome. And then from there, once you've kind of come up with the use case for where you're going to generate that business value, I would say, look at what it is you have already. I, I know that there are a lot of vendors out there that are now branding and selling data fabrics or data mesh. Um, but the reality in most large enterprises is that they've already made massive investments in a lot of different tools that could easily become uh, viable components in a data fabric implementation. So what is it that I have? And then third would be, all right, for my use case and for this particular pattern that I'm trying to implement for a fabric or, or mesh, what's missing? Um, and then you can selectively go in and look at, well, maybe I want to implement a graph technology to bring this in. Maybe I need stronger data quality tools, or maybe I need better scanning technologies so that I can automate the collection of metadata. There are a lot of different areas that you could focus. Um, and then lastly, it's the people, right? I mean, look, these are design patterns. They're not buy it, install it, it's done. Uh, this will materially impact how people access data, where you ask them to access data, the interfaces even from a user experience. So there's change control and, and user adoption that are also critical components to making this successful. Mm -hmm. So start with the business purpose, look where you can generate definitive value, look at what you have, look at what you're missing, and then get the right people involved to go and implement. And if you do that, you can do it in steps. And you know, there's nothing better when going to the CFO to ask for the budget for implementing this if you have a demonstrable result as you know, in result or because of an implementation of this at a smaller scale. Mm -hmm. And so being able to build the business case, build the larger value, and eventually get to ubiquitous availability of again, this information for all of those data consumers. Yeah. Yeah. And this, it, it's good in any number of domains, whether it's in marketing or in finance or some other place, but the key is to figure out where you're having trouble. I mean, this is what consultants will tell you all the time in IT enterprise system conversations is where is the friction point? Where are things going wrong in the organization? Let's start there. Is it customer experience? Is it is it supply chain? Whatever the case may be, you look for the friction points. You look where there's pain, where people are complaining, basically. Right, Doug? Yeah, and I think it's you know, <clears throat> everything that Rex said it was I would 100% echo. Uh, the only addition I would make it off the top of my head is is cultural because it is a cultural shift of a mindset. You know, we've we've gotten so trained. I think the technology solves everything. Well, yeah, 
but you have to understand why you're implementing that technology first. And again, you, you talked about business, you know, prioritizing it based on the business value. But if we, if you talk about domains too there, uh, uh, Eric, I think shifting the mindset from um, distributed data ownership, I own now, I own the data, but I'm thinking about it as I own the data, who are going to be my product, my, my data product users. I think that's another way you get to do it as part of the shift to tell the story you own the data, you own the quality of that data, but you got to treat the asset as something that's going to be shared or could be shared and accessed by anybody in the organization. But I think that's also still a cultural shift where I used to, this is how I did my data, this is my gut feel. Now it's being distributed everywhere. Uh, and I think, but you've got to, you know, to your point with Rex said, it's like that whole eating, eating the elephant concept. You know, you don't just eat an elephant all you know, one time. You pick a particular area to start with demonstrate to your CFO you've got success and you keep on going, but you prioritize that based on, you know, the business value is the best way to go. Hmm. But I think again, a cultural change is, is one of the biggest things, especially if you've got a lot of older school IT people who think about, you know, data as a table. And now we're thinking of data as a combination and the potential to bring it all together to do a lot more. That's a shift. Mm -hmm. And uh, Rex, I'll throw it over to you. You know, we, I was talking just this morning with someone about how we went from data to data warehouses to data lakes. And I, I wondered when that was happening, I'm like, are we making the same mistake again of thinking we can centralize all this data in one large instance and then have all these different applications ping it? I mean, this is one of the challenges that they've had with sort of big data analytics is the concurrency of users becomes a serious problem. And so I think data fabric is, uh, in a way, it's kind of like an escape hatch to get us away from that and to let the world remain federated, which it will be, no matter what you do. I promise the data world is going to be federated. It'll be probably more federated in the future. I think a data fabric is getting us to a place where we can be in harmony with that reality of federation. What do you think, Rex? Yeah, I completely agree. And and if you think about just the evolution of the, the data warehouses, and then you have data lakes, and now you've got lake houses, right? It's all continuing to go up a level to say, look, all of these technologies have their place in the landscape. They were designed and built to do something really well. Uh, where we've fallen into traps in the past is that we think everything then will be good if we just use this technology. And so um, uh, the idea of a data fabric it, at a higher level is that you can abstract where that lives. You can, you can add the components where it provides better performance or uh, localized data availability or fast query response. You know, the, the, there are a lot of technologies you can implement. But if you can do that at an abstracted level, again, at that semantic level, mm -hmm. uh, then you're taking advantage of the power of all of those technologies while still giving the responsiveness and the access that people are are yearning for. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. You know, there's a, I've heard this comment a couple of times on the shows. I'll just throw it over maybe for Doug and then Rex to comment on before our podcast bonus segment is coming up. But there's this joke that uh, we always believe in information systems that one more layer of abstraction can solve all our problems, <laughs> right? Because you, you you get out of the weeds of a particular environment. We just think about uh, the fact that you can't see. I remember watching Carl Sagan talk about uh, two-dimensional creatures, and if it, they're moving around and they're just in a two-dimensional world, but if you pick one up like this, all of a sudden it's a third dimension. And that's what you can get from a layer of abstraction. Now you can look down at something that before was bewildering. It's like being able to look down on top of a labyrinth and go, oh, okay, take left, right, left, right, and you're out of the labyrinth, right? That's kind of what we're talking about here in a metaphorical sense. What do you think, Doug, quick? Uh, you know, abstraction, I, I mean, I always think about plumbing and having just had a plumber out to my house do a couple of fixes a couple of days ago. Um, you don't think about your plumbing until there's a problem. Right. And ideally, you don't want to think about your data plumbing or your data infrastructure, your data ecosystem. You just want to get stuff out of it, you know, whether it's right. water, or data or insights. <laughs> and I'm kind of I'm being very loosey goosey with it. But I mean, it's sometimes just a simplistic approach. We don't want to worry about the plumbing. We want to worry about the business results. Are we making the right decisions based on this, you know, this top down three dimensional view you're talking about? Um, you know, it's you've got an architecture that you're focused on, not a software solution, and you're trying to abstract, going back to that, what data can be used by everybody and not worry about the processes underneath it all.
And again, that's where I think a knowledge graph can, connect, can be the connectivity tissue. Yeah, I think is important. Yep, that's right. Well, folks, podcast bonus segment is up next. You are listening to DM Radio.